This morning I want to share with you under the heading of the dominion of the law. Before we even begin to look at this topic, I just want to ask us to consider that there is one fundamental difference between Christianity and all false religion. In fact, I could even put it, there's one fundamental difference between true Christianity and all false concepts of Christianity and false religion. Because I believe that false Christianity builds on the same basic principle as all heathen religion. I gave this a lot of thought. And um, it took me a while before I, I, I could put my finger on the real difference. And I realized that Christianity provides a savior. That's the only difference. There are principles in Buddhism. There are rules in Buddhism as Somebody says, I, I haven't studied Buddhism, but I've heard it said that the, the laws, the rules of Buddhism are almost comparable to the Ten Commandments. Very, very similar. And Islam seems to uphold principles as noble as the Ten Commandments in, in, in some respects, you know. And I ask myself, what is the fundamental difference between Christianity and every false religion? And, and the conclusion I came to is that Christianity is the only religion that has a savior. Other religions have leaders, ideals, teachers, but every false religion, including false Christianity, builds on the principle that you must become in order to please God. Somehow you are going to make it if you become good enough to please God. Every false religion builds on this principle. Only Christianity says, God did for you what you could not do. Christianity provides a gift from a God of infinite love. And that makes it infinitely superior to anything else that exists on this planet. Now I believe that this is so important for us to understand because you, if we don't understand this we might find ourselves to be nothing but sophisticated pagans. We might find ourselves building on the same exact principle as paganism and calling upon the name of God and using the name of Christ when we are nothing but sophisticated pagans and that's a, a, a dangerous place to be in. You know that the Jews were the most religious of all. And the Jews, if there was ever a people who understood rules and regulations and laws and ideas, it was the Jews. And they understood it so well that it, 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 they, were, they were so zealous in defending these rules that they crucified the Son of God. It tells me that if you don't understand this principle... If you don't understand the basic foundation of Christianity, then you're in great danger. Now, there's something that I would like to explain right at the beginning. And I have been through this before and perhaps even here at the last camp meeting. But I think it is so important that we should understand at the beginning that I want to say it again. One of the things I believe is, is critical for us to understand is the difference between two different aspects of law. Now, there are two kinds of law that the Bible talks about. In fact, in general, we all know there are two kinds of law. There's what we call judicial law, and there's what we call natural law. Now, we all understand natural law. We take natural law for granted. And the most common illustration is gravity, right? Gravity works a certain way. A law, in this sense, is something that exists in nature that compels things to always operate in the same way. No matter what you do, you'll never throw a stone in the air and get it to come and let it to get it to continue going up. It always comes back. Not because you choose to make it happen. It's a law of nature. It's, it's a principle built into nature that compels things to always operate this way. And when Newton discovered this principle, he referred to it as the law of gravity. That is natural law. You have no control over that. It always operates this way. It's the way God designed the universe to work. 
but you have judicial law and judicial ju judicial law is always designed by an authority by a governing body the law says that if i come into america as an alien i have to have a passport and i have to pass through immigration and i have to be subject to these laws that men designed and if i break the law there there are certain penalties that men have imposed that will be put in place this is judicial law it doesn't happen by nature it is an authority a governing authority that makes this law now we have to understand the difference between judicial law and natural law because if we don't again the whole question of the law as it is presented in the bible and especially the new testament becomes confusing now there's one passage in particular that is very clear in in bringing out the point i'm making I, I just want us to turn here quickly um just go with me to romans chapter 7 quickly and let's just i don't want to spend too much time on this but i think it's important to grasp this idea at the very beginning romans chapter 7 and we see where paul talks about three different laws and maybe i should just go over to the board and write them here because i just like us to get the idea clearly now in in chapter 7 of romans i'm sorry in romans 7 and verse let's start with verse 21 paul says i find then a law that when i would do good evil is present with me that's let me say paul mentions law number one I find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now, let's first of all consider how this law works. What judicial body made that law? Was it a governing body that made this law that when Paul wanted to do good, he found himself doing evil? Was this a judicial law or a natural law? It was a natural law. It's a law of nature. Isn't that right? The way it works is like this. I decide to show love to brother Joel. And I find myself showing hate. Maybe, it's not, maybe that's so extreme it passes over your head. I decide that today I'm going to be a good boy. I'm going to do all the right things. And I find myself doing all the wrong things. Who made that rule? Who wrote down a law and said, every time you decide to do good, you must do evil. Nobody. It's a fact of life, of the nature of that this person Paul is talking about. He says, I find a law, I discover something working, and the way it works is like this. Anytime I want to do good, I find myself doing bad. This is not a judicial law. This is a law of nature. He goes to the next verse and he says... In verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So I'll call that law number two. He mentions the word law again. <laughs> law number two. And this law is the law of God. And he says, inwardly, I delight in the law of God. I love it. I like it. I appreciate it inwardly. Now, which law is he talking about when he says, I delight in the law of God? The Ten Commandments. Judicial law. That's right. Somebody designed that law and wrote it down and ordered you to keep it. This is not a natural principle that exists in nature this way. It's, 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 it's something you are, you are commanded to do. And Paul says, I like this law. Verse 23. But I see another law. He's speaking again of the first law. I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind, the Ten Commandments, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, back again to law number one. So he says there are two laws that are in conflict. One of them is the law of God that says you must. The other one is the law in my members, which he calls the law of sin, which says you cannot. It's like, it's like I, I, I've used this illustration. It's like I say, I say to, to Mark, Mark, the next time you fall, I want you to go up instead of down. And if you don't, I'm going to beat you. Now what I've done, I've sentenced him to a beating every time he falls. Because he will never go up. Because he cannot defy the law of gravity. 
So my law becomes an impossible thing for Mark. He might desire ever so much to fall up because he wants to escape these beatings, but he cannot fall up. He has to fall down. So all that happens is that he's going to get beating after beating because he can never fall up. That's what this man says is happening to him. Isn't that right? He says, I love the law of God and I want to do it, but I find that there is a law in my body that compels me to disobey that law. I want to do it. But this law of sin in my members makes it impossible. And then he goes on to talk about, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Because as long as he survives in this body of death, he will never obey the law number two, the law of his mind. So we go down to chapter 8 and look at what Paul says now. I want to read verses 2 and 3. In verse 2, Paul says, For the law of the spirit of life, a third law, law number 3, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, where is this law? Now, is this natural law or is this judicial law? Is this, this law in Christ Jesus, is it a rule that a governing authority made? We haven't even finished looking at it, but you can say right from the beginning, no, because this law exists in a person. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now he says something makes me free from law number one. And he calls that something the law of of the spirit of life. And where does it exist? Where does it exist? In Christ. Now look at how it works. Verse 3. For what the law could not do. Yeah, let's just continue. I don't, I don't want us to be distracted. For what the law could not do. Which law is he talking about? The Ten Commandments. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. There was something in the flesh, law number two, that made law number one impotent. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, in order to overcome law number two, what did God do? I should, I should, I should. Let me do it quickly. All right. <laughs> Number one is the law of sin. That is the law in my flesh. And this is, um, this is a natural law. Number two is the law of God. And this is judicial law. And this is judicial law. And number three is the law of the Spirit. And I'll just put a little... Um, this is natural law. This is natural law. And this is judicial law, or we could say legal law. So we have two different kinds of laws, and we have three manifestations of the two laws there. Now because of thi th this law, because of this law, this law becomes impotent. Because of the law of sin in my body, the law of God becomes helpless. What the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh. The law can command me over and over to be good. But there is a problem and the problem is there is a law of sin in my body. What I need is something to cancel the law of sin in my body. I need a greater law than the law of sin in my body. Just like if you are to escape from gravity you need a greater law. You need the law of aerodynamics to enable you to escape from gravity, right? And so you can get in a plane and fly if you apply the law of aerodynamics, the laws of aerodynamics. 
In the same way, if you, when the law of the spirit of life comes, suddenly the law of sin is cancelled. Where does the law of the spirit exist? In Christ. In Christ Jesus. So there are these three laws. And I, would, I, I want us to understand this principle. Because if we don't, you can't understand the things that Paul says about the law. Because in some places Paul makes it clear that the law of God stands forever. He says, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. No, we establish the law. But then he goes on to say, but now we are delivered from the law. He says we are free from the law. He says, he says we are dead to the law. Galatians 2 and verse 18. I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. So he makes these statements and the evangelicals come and they throw those statements that talk about being dead to the law. They throw them at you. And you come back and you throw those about the law standing forever. You throw them back at them. And you end up thinking the Bible is confused. Because somehow it's so difficult. Nobody tries to harmonize all those statements together. But I'm telling you that in, in understanding this is the key to finding the harmony. That's one principle. And the second one I want to mention is that there are two aspects of the law of God. And it's related to this. The law of God is referred to by Paul. Well, let me read it. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And you'll see what are these two aspects of the law of God. In verse 6, Paul speaks of our, our calling as God's witnesses. And he says, Who has also, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now what is he talking about? If you look at verse 7, you'll see what he's talking about. He says, but if the ministration of death, now this is a phrase that it bites it bites hard, especially to an Adventist. The first person who ever, ever challenged me with this verse was a Jehovah's Witness, and I had no answer for him. But it was such a blessing because I had to go home and dig up my Bible and study and study and study till I finally got what the passage was saying. But he talks about the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. What is he talking about? The Ten Commandments. And he calls it the ministration of death. Written and engraven in stones was glorious. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses. For the glory of his countenance. Which glory was to be done away. He says how shall not the ministration of the spirit be glorious. Be rather glorious. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory. Much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. There's a ministration that brings nothing but condemnation. And there's a ministration that brings righteousness. They are both related to the same law, but one aspect of it brings death and one aspect brings righteousness. And if you don't understand the difference, you are, you are confused. What Paul is talking about is the same thing we have been trying to explain here. There is an aspect of the law that is judicial. And there is an aspect of the law that is natural. Where does the natural part of it rest? In Christ Jesus. Christ is the living law. Amen. Christ is the spiritual law. Paul says in verse 17 of the same chapter we just have been reading. He says, now the Lord is that spirit. In other words, think about it, brothers and sisters. Which existed first? Was it God or the Ten Commandments? God. Why does God do good? Is it because of the Ten Commandments? Does somebody have to remind God in the morning, you shall love? Why does He love? It's ridiculous to think that God needs a set of rules to remind Himself that He must love His creatures. God naturally is the living embodiment of the Ten Commandments. One day God decided to write down his character 
in a basic form. And he put it in ten phrases and he gave it to Moses on the top of a mountain. People thought that this description was righteousness. It was only stone, brothers and sisters. It was a representation of reality. It was not reality. The reality of what is written on stone, where does it exist? In God, in Christ, He is living righteousness. Now you want righteousness and you go to consult stone? You will find nothing but frustration. To find righteousness, you must go to the source of righteousness. And righteousness exists in only one being and His Son in this universe. That is the living law. That is the law that gives life. That is the spirit of the law. The letter will kill you. Because the letter is like last year. I use this illustration and I use it again. Right? This is... This is my, my wife. But it isn't. It's only a representation. So I need somebody to love and somebody... To, and I, I, I kiss the picture and I go to bed with it at night. What will it do to me? It will drive me crazy. <laughs> it will frustrate me. Because it cannot give me love. It can only tell me something about the person where I can find it. If I need to be satisfied, I've got to find the real thing and stop playing with pictures. When people play with what is written on stone and believe that this can bring righteousness. You're like this man I saw beating his head against a brick wall. It will never, never beat down the wall and it will never help your head. So, if we understand these two aspects of the law, if we understand these two, two aspects of the law, then we can begin to un understand what Paul means when he speaks of the law negatively and when he speaks of the law positively. There are the two aspects. And I am dealing with this and I'm dwelling on this and I'm sitting on this and I won't get up off this because brothers and sisters, many of us, and this was true of myself, had gotten hold of the wrong side of the law and we were going nowhere. And I'm anxious that what God designed for the Advent movement should be fulfilled in us. And if, you, if we don't understand this, how can we ever hope to have it fulfilled? We just become nothing more better than, as I said, sophisticated pagans. Now I'd like us to go to Romans chapter 7, because my, my subject this morning is the dominion of the law. And I haven't even gotten fully into that yet. But let's go to Romans chapter 7. Now in, in Romans chapter 7, and again I want to quickly illustrate this on the board, because I find that illustrations can be very helpful. In Romans chapter 7, we have a picture of... A woman and two husbands. One woman and two husbands. Now, I'm just going to use some circles to represent these people, just for convenience's sake. Now, in the middle here, I'm going to put the woman. And um, on her side here, I'll put the first husband. The first husband and um, husband number one. And over here, I'll put husband number two. All right, let's read what it says about these, these three people. And let's see what we can understand. Now, Paul uses illustrations a lot. And, um, yes, yes. Well, I didn't even draw him close enough because the Bible says two become one. So, it, it, they should have been overlapping. But Paul likes to use illustrations, and I, I found that illustrations sometimes bring out things much more clearly than just using words. Now Paul says, Know ye not, brethren, in verse 1, For I speak to them that know the law. And Paul would have been pleased to be speaking to this audience, because we are people, above all others in the world, who know the law. I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now the word dominion. It comes from, uh, it comes from uh, words that are related to it are words like dominate. And in fact it comes from the, 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 Latin, the Greek word kurios, 
which means Lord. So the word dominion means to have lordship over a person. You know who a lord is. One who has dominion is one who controls and rules. And, and Paul speaks to people who knows the law and he says, you know this, I don't have to tell you. As long as a man lives, the law has dominion or rulership or lordship over his life. Paul goes on to illustrate this statement by saying, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Now this was according to the culture of the time, the culture of Israel. You know that a man could give his wife a paper and just put her away anytime he wanted. How could a woman escape if she didn't like the marriage? She couldn't. He had to die. She had to put something in his, in his, in his breakfast. <laughs> if he died, then she could escape. But there was no other escape. She was bound as long as he lived. And what was it that kept her in that place? The law. The law was the agent that kept her bound to this husband. Now Paul is using this illustration because these people would understand exactly what he meant. The only escape from the husband is death. Verse 3 says, So then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no, no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So, even if she has her eyes on somebody else, the only possibility of ever having that man is, is, is that the first husband has to die. Now verse 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, now here is the point of this whole illustration, and we have to understand. Look carefully. Wherefore, my brethren, you also, now somebody in that illustration represents the you, are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, clearly, if Christ is the one that you are to be married to, that you could not marry before, then Christ represents husband number two, right? That green circle over there. That represents Christ. Now, who is the woman and who is husband number one? That's the question. Who is the woman? Now Paul says, you have become dead to the law that you should become married to the next husband. I read this and I got a little confused. And I read a commentary on it and I got more confused. And it took me several years to finally work out. And it's, it's simple, it's superficial. But, but it's not so simple if you have not read chapter 6 chapter 7 and chapter 8. But you know clearly, husband number 2, that green circle represents Christ. So who do you say the, the, the woman represents? Us! In some kind of way. But then the million dollar question is, who is husband number 1? Praise the Lord. It's nice to be dealing with an educated audience because the first time I read a comment on it, they said that the first husband was the law. And that kind of confused me very badly. But here you find that Paul views you, the individual, as being a two-dimensional being. He, in fact, he, 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 he views you as somebody who is married. You have two individuals living inside of you. You have you and you have your husband, all in the one person. He splits us into two there. And this is a critical reality of what we are that many people will not accept. The woman represents my will. That part of me that desires better. The husband represents what Paul calls the flesh, or the body of sin, or the carnal mind. I am married to this. How long have I been married to this husband? I was born married. Now, how long have you been married, Janet, to Don? 35 years. And they have been together 35 years and I bet they are not willing to be separated. I have been married, well, no, 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 no. If I had not been a Christian, I would have been married to my old man for 55 years. This old man has been through every bad time and every good time, every evil situation, every stress, every trial with me. It's not easy to give up that husband. 
And many people are very reluctant to give up that old husband. But you know the Bible says you cannot be married to the second husband unless the first one dies. What is it that keeps you in that place? Not according to what Paul says. Not according to what Paul says. Well, maybe I didn't ask my question right. What is it that keeps you bound to the self? The law, right. I asked the question wrong. The law. According to Paul's illustration, natural law, natural law. But I'm going to show you that also judicial law. Something keeps you bound to the flesh. And as long as you are under the dominion of this thing, you are bound to flesh and you will never escape. Now I'll show you how Paul says it very, very clearly. Let's read a few other, uh, a little further down in the passage. It says in verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, notice I like how he talks. He puts being in the flesh where? In the past tense. You Christians are no longer in the flesh. You Christians no longer have the body of sin. You Christians no longer have the carnal mind. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Because the word of God is the truth and everybody else is a liar who says otherwise. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. So says the word of God. When we were in the flesh, praise the Lord, past tense. The motions of sin, which were what? What is it that stirs up sin? According to what he says, it is the law. And remember what I said at the beginning. If you don't understand that when Paul speaks negatively of the law, he's speaking of what? The letter of the law. The letter of the law stirs up sin. That is why it is called the, the ministry of condemnation. When you are under the dominion of the letter of the law, all it does is condemn you because it says, Thou shalt not steal. And I say, I will try. And I'm a thief. And it says, If you steal, you will die. Thou shalt not steal. I, I'm not going to. And I steal. And it says, You will die. It commands and it orders and it demands. It never helps. It never helps. It's like me telling the dog, If you bark, I beat you. Poor dog. Because he was born to bark. The carnal man. The carnal mind. Is not subject to the law of God. And what? It cannot be. Impossibility. The carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God. So when the law comes upon a carnal man and says. You must not. It only condemns him. And Paul says, when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law, and I'm going to explain that in a moment, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held. What is it that held us that we are now delivered from? What is it? Yes. Thank you, Sister Sandy. The question was, what is it that held us, which we are now delivered from? It's the carnal mind. Now we are delivered from the law because the thing that held us bound, we are now delivered from it. Now remember, a woman is bound to her husband by the law as long as the husband is alive. But if the husband is dead, she's free from the law's dominion. The law can no longer control her marriage Life. Because the husband dead sets her free. She can now marry whom she pleases. And Paul is using this as a basis for our understanding. Our, our relationship to the law. Now he says. We are delivered from the law. Because the thing that held us is dead. That we should serve how? In the newness of spirit. Natural law. And not in the oldness of the letter. Judicial law. Absolutely. That's what he's saying. But he goes on to explain. He goes on as I, would, as I would go on when I'm saying this to say, is the law sin? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. 
I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, now, yesterday I tried to explain that what he was saying was not that I would not have been able to define sin. He's saying that I would not have known the presence of sin in me except by the law. For I would not have known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, you are full of lust, you are full of sin. Let me use another illustration. I'm going to show you how the law stirs up sin. To explain what Paul means. Since we have been going, since we have been here, I noticed something that some homes, if there's a carpet, as soon as you get inside, you are required to take off your shoes. Pete and Missy have not told anybody to take off their shoes when they are going into the house. I notice that we all walk in and we come in with our shoes and so on and we walk on the carpet and so on. Nobody has any problem, right? Now, none of us is guilty and none of us is a sinner for walking on the carpet in our shoes because there's no law. But if, if, if they make a rule and, 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 and say, you know, the time is wet, please take off your shoes when you come in. The moment somebody walks in with your shoes, you become, you become a sinner, right? You become a transgressor, isn't that right? What makes you a transgressor is the rule because you were doing it all along. And there was nothing wrong. But as soon as the rule is made, you become a transgressor. What is worse? If you like this lady over here, put this thing on her foot. If you can't take off your shoes. And you have to walk in with the shoe. Every time you see the law. And the law says take off your shoes. And you cannot take off your shoes. You are condemned to continue to sin. The law turns you into a sinner because you are doing this freely. And there wasn't a problem, but then the law comes and says, if you do it, you're a sinner and you can't stop doing it. So the law makes you into a sinner by defining sin as, you, as what you're doing. That's what Paul means. Because look at what he goes on to say. He says, Verse 8, but sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Now understand, as I was trying to say yesterday, this is not something bad. No. If, you're a, if you are dirty and you don't know, you need to be told that you are dirty. It's alright for me to be running around with, with, with my face full of dirt and my body smelling bad. It's alright. When I have absolutely no idea of how offensive it is. But when something comes along and tells me you're offensive, you're a stench, you're, you, you, you make it hard for people to be near you. Then it becomes a problem to me. Then I have to find a way to solve that difficulty. But you telling me that it is so only helps me by helping me to find a solution. By telling me that it is so, what have you done for me? You have brought condemnation upon me. You have made me feel dirty and unclean and bad about myself. And if that's where you leave me then you have not really helped me. The help that you have given me is to show me my condition and put me in a position where I desire to find a solution to the difficulty. This is the legitimate place of the letter of the law. The letter of the law makes us know our condition to drive us to the living law in whom we find the reality of righteousness, in whom we find an escape from that condemnation that the law could bring upon me but never deliver me from. You can see brothers and sisters that if I am ever to be righteous I must escape the dominion of the law. The interesting thing about the letter of the law, I want to, you know I keep saying the letter of the law, I want to be careful that I say exactly what I mean. I am meaning that aspect of the law which is judicial. It demands but never produces. If I don't escape that dominion, then 
I'm not going to be any better. And this is so important for us to understand. You know, the, the, the law, the letter of the law, keeps me bound to the flesh. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain how. Thou shalt not kill. That's what the, the letter of the law says. If I have hatred against you in my heart, does the letter of the law deal with that? No. The letter of the law is specific. Thou shalt not kill. If I don't take a knife and drive it into your heart, I have not broken the letter of the law. In order to break the letter of the law, I must do something on a physical level. The letter of the law does not relate to what happens on an inward spiritual level. It cannot relate to that. So the letter of the law only relates to the flesh. And as long as I'm relating to the letter of the law, I always operate where? Externally, always on the basis of the flesh. So as long as my relationship is with the letter of the law, it keeps me bound to the flesh. And as long as I'm in the flesh, what will be the result? I will never do righteousness. My Lord, so therefore, as long as you deal with the letter of the law, you are bound to sin as long as you live. You must escape the dominion of the law. You must find a different kind of government. And this is one of the most important things that commandment keepers need to understand. No wonder that in 1888, Ellen White could have said, We need to hear less of the law. Let us preach Christ. Let the law take care of itself. Because these people have preached the law till they are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And that is what happens when you deal with the letter of the law. You either become a great hypocrite, convincing yourself like the rich man that all these things have I done from my youth up, when it's a, it's a straight lie. You either convince yourself that the, the lie is true, or you, you degrade righteousness. You degrade righteousness. You convince yourself that, that by your legalistic behavior, you are really becoming righteous. You belittle God's infinite righteousness down to the standard of human behavior. You think that by human actions you can produce righteousness? That's what happens when you think that by observance of the letter of the law you can become righteous. So Paul, we really need to escape from the dominion of the law and we need to find another kind of dominion. Now I just want to point out something here. I want to emphasize something a little bit more. There are three three aspects and my time is almost up I'm going to try to wrap up everything that I have left to say very quickly there are three aspects to man's relationship to the law or to man's Christian experience now look at what Paul says let's go back to verse verse 9 in fact let me illustrate it here on the board as well so we can get the picture more clearly in our minds I could divide the life of a person into three sections. The first section I would call before the law. Look at verse 9. It says, I was alive without the law once. Is that right? So there was a time when in Paul's mind, either he was not aware of the law or he was not aware of the requirements of the law or the requirements of the law made no impact on him. I was at that place once. There was a time in my, law when I, in my life when I did not care about the law of God. And I was a carefree sinner if there is such a thing to some extent. I didn't care about the law. I didn't care how I was living my life. You have seen people who are not Christians and they seem to be happy. That was me. I didn't care about the law. I was alive without the law once. I had no sense of condemnation on my brain. But then he says, Then the commandment came, and sin revived, and I died. I would refer to this second section as being under the law. In fact, I would describe the man that, Roma, that Paul is dealing with in Romans 7. I would say that this person is a man under the law. For me, the man under the law is a man under the conviction of right and wrong. But he's incapable of doing it. 
The law comes home to his conscience and he wants to do it. And he tries to do it, but he's incapable of doing it. He's under the law. That is your condition when you are under the dominion of the law. You always want to do good and you never succeed. You live under constant condemnation. You're like the poor Adventists who say, you say to them, have you received salvation? And they stop and they think and they say, I don't know. They say, they say I hope one day. And they will say, God is not finished with me. They cannot say that today in Christ I have salvation. That is so tragic. That is so tragic. And the reason for it is that they are measuring themselves by their behavior. And they measure their behavior by the, 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 the letter of the law. And under that kind of dominion, they have no hope of escaping this terrible trap. Where they yearn for something that they never can achieve. They don't learn. They have not learned that it is a gift in Christ Jesus. And like I said yesterday, if you stay, if you are under number one, the first section, if that's where you are, and you move to section number two, and you're going to stop in section number two, you are better off to stay at number one. Because when you are under the first section, you're a sinner, but you're a happy sinner. When you go to section number two, you are still a sinner, but you're a miserable sinner. You have to move to section number three, where you are delivered from the law. You have before the law, when the law is irrelevant. You have under the law, when the law dominates and rules your life. And you have delivered from the law, where you, are, where you move from the law, the judicial law, the letter of the law. You go to the law of the spirit of life. Here is where God's children are. Here is where you are free. And the Bible speaks about it so many times. I'm going to go through, I'm just going to read quickly a string of texts. I'm, I just have them on my paper here. I'm not going to read the Bible because we don't have the time. But Paul says, Romans 7 verse 7, the law exposes sin. I have not known sin but by the law. Romans 5 and verse 13 tells you that the purpose of the law is to impute sin to man because it says sin is not imputed when there is no law. Romans 5 and verse 20 says that the law entered that the offense might abound. The law makes sin greater. Romans 7 and verse 13 says that, that sin by the commandment might become what? Exceedingly sinful. The commandment makes sin more sinful. Romans 3 and verse 19 says, whatever things the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that what? That all the world might become guilty before God. The law makes you guilty. That is its purpose. The truth is that the law neither makes you more, makes you worse or makes you better. It only tells you the truth. It only makes you see the truth. It cannot make you better and it does not make you worse. But it makes you see the truth. And you have to know the truth. That you can turn to the truth. That's the legitimate purpose of the law. Romans 4 and verse 15 says, The law worketh wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Romans 7 and verse 8 says that the law gives sin an opportunity for sin taking occasion by the commandment. Romans 7 and verse 9 says that the law gives sin life because when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And over and over and over and over. But it all ties together when you go to Galatians 3 and verse 24 where it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That is where God always wanted to take us because Christ is the goal of the law. Christ, Romans 10 and verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law. Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You want righteousness? Follow where the law drives you and you will go to Christ. Now, I would like to say more, but I guess... I'm going to have to save some for another day. It is so important. You know, humanity tends to do things. Tends to go from extreme to extreme. That's the way of human nature. As soon as we become... Somebody might say, I'm obsessed with righteousness by faith. And I agree. <laughs> and, and 
I, I've thought about the obsessions I've had since I became a Christian. When I just started, I was obsessed with the mark of the beast for about 10 years. All I studied was prophecy. And I'm not, I'm not regretting that, I, that I, I, I did all that studying. And then you know that for another 8 years or so, all I spoke about was the Godhead. And I'm not regretting that either because I believe the foundation of understanding the truth about God is vital to what I am now understanding. But finally, I got righteousness by faith. I had studied it all this time and could never quite get it. Finally, I got it. And now I understand why Ellen White says, this truth is to swallow up every other truth. Finally, I understand. Finally, I look at the Bible and I see everything is about Christ. Christ is all and in all. Now I understand why Paul says, I will know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. Now I understand. And by God's grace, I will never preach another doctrine until I can put it in the framework of Christ. Because I realize that all the doctrines that we have, the state of the dead, everything, it only makes real sense placed in the framework of Christ being everything. I understand that. And the glory of God that fills the earth finally is the glory of Christ risen upon His people. If we don't study these things and understand these things, what is this dream that we're going to receive the latter rain? What is this dream about being among the 144,000? 160 something years of Adventist history with people talking about being the remnant. And they're all in their graves and buried. And this generation is going the same place if you don't move out of the mold. Who was it? One of these geniuses said, it is lunacy. To continue to do the same things in the same way and expect a different result. It is lunacy. You're mad if you think you're going to do just as the pioneers did and just as your four parents did and believe the same exact things and have a different result. You are mad. Somebody has got to break the mold. Some new element has got to come into our religion. Something we have not understood before. Something we have not seen and not known. And every time God pushes up his head, somebody says, He's attacking our faith. Just because nobody ever said it before. We think God is dead. We think God is bound in our boxes. We think God is bound by our rules. God will be God. And when light comes, it's going to come in a way that most people don't expect. Because if you expected it, you would have had it before. What is wonderful is that everything that, I, that we are seeing is strictly the Bible. And what I appreciate is that in all the opposition that has come to what we have been saying, nobody has ever taken the Bible and says, said, here is why you are wrong scripturally. Nobody has done it and nobody can do it because if, if the Bible is wrong, then I am wrong. But only if the Bible is wrong. Because God has, has given, given me one benefit that I appreciate so much. It is that for the last three years, this is what I have been studying. You know how God has been making, making me study? I have, an ex, I have a, a notebook at home. Every word. I write down everything I can think about about that word. Somebody says, where are you getting all these thoughts from? You know, you know where it's coming from? Every word. I sit down in the mornings two hours before day breaks. And I have my Bible. And I'm taking the verse. Sometimes I'm three weeks on one verse. Word by word. I write down a word and everything I can think about that word. I look at context. I go back. I go forward. And it's like light is just bursting out. Different insights and understanding. It's like the Apostle Paul that is so hard to understand has become the most beautiful, simplest thing to understand. And that all may be a little irrelevant to what I'm saying this morning. But sometimes, you know, I'm a little overwhelmed by everything. So, I want to thank you brothers and sisters for listening. And I want to thank our Father for what He's doing for us. And I want to thank Him that this is a part of a process that is not going to stop, not this time. 
we're on the way home. And as you see the signs happening around you and you know that we're on the last leg of the journey, know that as the events are taking place in the world, among God's people, there must be a corresponding revival. And a revival is not going to be based on human effort. It's going to be based upon a response to divine truth. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Let's pray.